We got a couple more minutes here, guys. Logan. Okay, you guys who are here, you're going to be laughing all the way to the bank with all these participation points you're getting. Seeing my agenda, Mr. Page? Cool. All right, guys, uh, lesson 16 grammar is due last night. That's been checked. I will post a key later. Vocab lesson 50. You know, I think that's wrong, isn't it? Yes. Both of those are 15, aren't they? Fixed. Okay. Uh, vocab lesson 15. Uh, also, student tonight, those are synced for now. We'll have a grammar test next week. Okay. Uh, excuse me, a vocab test next week. Okay. So, today in class, we are going to do this, even if it's just three or four of you. We're going to read starting from paragraph 21 in Marigolds. Oh, gosh. There's another mistake there. I must have been typing this in a hurry. Look at that. I can't not have a quotation mark there. And probably read another 20 paragraphs, and then we'll read the last third of the story tomorrow. Although I think I'm going to hold off on a live session tomorrow and let you guys finish that on your own and probably do the quiz. Okay. But all we need to worry about for today is just continuing to annotate. I'm, I haven't checked yet, but hopefully you guys annotated the first 20 paragraphs. And we'll move on from there. So. Let's go over to, I think I'm going to have to open up study sync here. And again, you guys can go back to your study sync page. But if you're going to annotate while we read, then you would have to do that, right? But if you want to just read and watch me, uh, then that's fine too. Whatever's most comfortable. Okay, so, so far we had a lot of exposition, right? A lot of her talking about the speaker, right? Who we 
kind of assume is really the author herself. And she's talking about her childhood in general. Can you guys take it down a notch a little bit? I'm live here. Thanks. And when we left off, they had just gotten to Miss Lottie's house and they seem kind of bored, like they're up to something. Uh, maybe no good, right? And I'm realizing now as I turn the audio on, that I'm going to have to get it to exactly the place where I want it, which is going to take a sec. I should plan. When I think of the hometown of my youth. First of all, you can hear that, right? All that I seem to. Okay. Let's see here, probably around there. And in language, which only he could understand. A little bit farther, right? Fish brown. And her face had Indian-like features and the stern stoicism that one associates with Indian necessities, which depend on... We were far too sophisticated. Look, there she is, I whispered. There we go. That didn't take too long, did it? That's paragraph 20. You guys there? And here we go. Forgetting that Miss Lottie could not possibly have heard me from that distance. She's fooling with them crazy flowers. Yeah, look at her. Miss Lottie's marigolds were perhaps the strangest part of the picture. Certainly they did not fit in with the crumbling decay of the rest of her yard. Beyond the dusty brown yard, in front of the sorry gray house, rose suddenly and shockingly a dazzling strip of bright blossoms, clumped together in enormous mounds, warm and passionate and sun-golden. The old black witch woman worked on them all summer, every summer, down on her creaky knees, weeding and cultivating and arranging, while the house crumbled and John Burke rocked. For some perverse reason, we children hated those marigolds. They interfered with the perfect ugliness of the place. They were too beautiful. They said too much that we could not understand. They did not make sense. There was something in the vigor with which the old woman destroyed the weeds that intimidated us. It should have been a comical sight, the old woman with the man's hat on her cropped white head, leaning over the bright mounds, her big backside in the air. But it wasn't comical. It was something we could not name. We had to annoy her by whizzing a pebble into her flowers or by yelling a dirty word, then dancing away from her rage, reveling in our youth and mocking her age. Actually, I think it was the flowers we wanted to destroy. But nobody had the nerve to try it, not even Joey, who was usually fool enough to try anything. Y'all get some stones, commanded Joey now, and was met with instant giggling obedience as everyone, except me, began to gather pebbles from the dusty ground. Come on, Elizabeth. I just stood there peering through the bushes, torn between wanting to join the fun and feeling that it was all a bit silly. You scared, Elizabeth? I cursed and spat on the ground, my favorite gesture of phony bravado. Y'all children get the stones. I'll show you how to use them. I said before that we children were not consciously aware of how thick were the bars of our cage. I wonder now, though, whether we were not more aware of it than I thought. Perhaps we had some dim notion of what we were and how little chance we had of being anything else. Otherwise, why would we have been so preoccupied with destruction? Anyway, the pebbles were collected quickly, and everybody looked at me to begin the fun. Come on, y'all. We crept to the edge of the bushes that bordered the narrow road in front of Miss Lottie's place. She was working placidly, kneeling over the flowers. Her dark hand plunged into the golden mound. Suddenly, zing! An expertly aimed stone cut the head off one of the blossoms. You're muted, sir. Sorry, guys. I thought someone was responding. I got all excited. <laughs> My question was, what? Uh, 
What is that what you guys were talking about? I didn't go to teachers. It's not somebody who's going to be in the building anytime soon either. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. I know that was coming. I guess all you guys had probably seen that, but Mr. Page and I both had not. I what happened? Her. Did you guys? Oh, you guys are home. You probably couldn't make out the audio of that. So apparently, some student, I guess a remote student, um, sent a to all students email of him or herself holding a firearm. And uh, uh, obviously, that person is in, is in huge trouble. So Mr. Fisher was reassuring everybody that person is not in the building. Um, and they've traced it to the person that it is. And that person obviously will probably never be in the building again and might be in a different kind yeah. of building soon. <laughs> so, wow. Okay. Well, my question that I was trying to say before I uh, unmuted myself, thank you, Ethan, was why are these kids, with how they are growing up and their setting, why, why are they bothering to go mess with this lady? And particularly her beautiful flowers, maybe that, does that have something to do with it? I mean, all we can do is guess, it hasn't been said. What would motivate them? Not a good motivation, but what would motivate them? They're beautiful flowers, right? Uh, always with the chat, you guys. Okay. Uh, because they because they hated her so much. But why? Why would they hate? Her? They don't have any reason to hate her. Hated her. Or hated her flowers. Is that what you meant, Cami? Or what? Because I think it has something to do with the flowers. Yeah. Why? So why would they hate her flowers? Because they're beautiful. Why would you hate something because it's beautiful? It doesn't make sense at the surface, right? But with their situation, does it on some level? Maybe just because they're being kids. I'm not sure. I think that's part of it. I think that's why they don't realize what they're doing, but I think there's some more emotions at work there, maybe too. Maybe some bitterness, right? Since they are poor, they don't have a lot. They don't have a lot to do because they don't have a lot, partly. And partly because it's the summer, right? And they're kids. But maybe it's it's a, a bitterness over some aspect of their own existence and they're and they're targeting someone who doesn't really have anything to do with that, right? Because they just have to vent and let it out somehow. Right. Um, and that's not good, right? But that's probably part of the point of the story, right? Is the author is kind of acknowledging this thing that she did as a kid and maybe kind of reconsidering it uh, from the future, right? Because this is, you can tell this is all a flashback it's being told by the person, right? Okay, moving on. Who out there? So paragraph 30. Miss Lottie's backside came down and her head came up as her sharp eyes searched the bushes. You better get. We had crouched down out of sight in the bushes where we stifled the giggles that insisted on coming. Miss Lottie gazed warily across the road for a moment then cautiously returned to her weeding. Zing. Joey sent a pebble into the blooms, and another marigold was beheaded. Miss Lottie was enraged now. She began struggling to her feet, leaning on a rickety cane and shouting, Y'all get, go on home. Then the rest of the kids let loose with their pebbles, storming the flowers and laughing wildly and senselessly at Miss Lottie's impotent rage. She shook her stick at us and started shakily toward the road, crying, Get long! John Burke! John Burke! Come help! Then I lost my head entirely, mad with the power of inciting such rage, and ran out of the bushes in the storm of pebbles straight toward Miss Lottie, chanting madly, Old witch fell in a ditch, 
picked up a penny and thought she was rich. The children screamed with delight, dropped their pebbles, and joined the crazy dance, swarming around Miss Lottie like bees and chanting, Old Lady Witch, while she screamed curses at us. The madness lasted only a moment, for John Burke, startled at last, lurched out of his chair, and we dashed for the bushes just as Miss Lottie's cane went whizzing at my head. I did not join the merriment when the kids gathered again under the oak in our bare yard. Suddenly I was ashamed, and I did not like being ashamed. The child in me sulked and said it was all in fun, but the woman in me flinched at the thought of the malicious attack that I had led. The mood lasted all afternoon. When we ate the beans and rice that was supper that night, I did not notice my father's silence, for he was always silent these days. Nor did I notice my mother's absence, for she always worked until well into evening. Joey and I had a particularly bitter argument after supper. His exuberance got on my nerves. Finally, I stretched out upon the pallet in the room we shared and fell into a fitful doze. When I awoke, somewhere in the middle of the night, my mother had returned, and I vaguely listened to the conversation that was audible through the thin walls that separated our rooms. At first I heard no words, only voices. My mother's voice was like a cool, dark room in summer, peaceful, soothing, quiet. I loved to listen to it. It made things seem all right somehow. But my father's voice cut through hers, shattering the peace. Twenty-two years, Maybelle, twenty-two years, he was saying, and I got nothing for you, nothing, nothing. It's all right, honey, you'll get something. Everybody out of work now, you know that. Sorry, this is something that doesn't seem to have anything directly to do with what was the action of the story, right? She's back home. She's waking up from a nap. She's hearing this conversation with her parents. But it's important because what does it show? Well, it shows where she comes from, right? And from this conversation, when the mom says 22 years, 22, or the father says that, and I got nothing for you, nothing. And she says, it's all right. You'll get something. Everybody had to work. Uh, now you know that this is a depression, right? So we can tell they don't have a lot, but there's love between the parents, but it's tough times, right? So maybe that kind of feeds into the reason that she's kind of letting out you know, this anger, it's because of the existence that they're having to leave. It doesn't make it right that she's picking on this old lady, right? But maybe that's why it's happening. It ain't right. Ain't no man ought to eat his woman's food year in and year out and see his children running wild. Ain't nothing right about that. Honey, you took good care of us when you had it. Ain't nobody got nothing nowadays. I ain't talking about nobody else. I'm talking about me. God knows I try. My mother said something I could not hear, and my father cried out louder, What must a man do? Tell me that. Look, we ain't starving. I get paid every week, and Mrs. Ellis is real nice about giving me things. She gonna let me have Mr. Ellis's old coat for you this winter. Damn Mr. Ellis's coat, and damn his money. You think I want white folks' leavings? Damn, Maybelle. And suddenly he sobbed, loudly and painfully, and cried helplessly and hopelessly in the dark night. I had never heard a man cry before. I did not know men ever cried. I covered my ears with my hands, but could not cut off the sound of my father's harsh, painful, despairing sobs. My father was a strong man, who could whisk a child upon his shoulders and go singing through the house. My father whittled toys for us and laughed so loud that the great oak seemed to laugh with him and taught us how to fish and hunt rabbits. How could it be that my father was crying? But the sobs went on, unstifled, finally quieting until I could hear my mother's voice, deep and rich, humming softly as she used to hum to a frightened child. You're muted again, Mr. Cooney. 
I am rusty today. There's a lot of there's a lot of noise in my room with all the stuff going on, so I keep going back and forth between mute and not. So the speaker is overhearing her mom comforting her dad like she would comfort her, which is really despairing, uh, which is really um, depressing to her because she's looked at her father probably as like this pillar of strength and everything, right? But because of the circumstances, racism probably in there too. Um, he's having such a hard time. Okay, so we'll stop there for today. Okay, and I'll, I'll go ahead and let you know right now that I'm gonna want you to finish that story, like the last third of it, and do the quiz questions by Sunday night, okay? So you can read on right now, keep on annotating, or you can work on tomorrow during class, we won't have a live session. Um, but I hope that what you do isn't blow all this off and then think to yourself Sunday, oh, is there something I'm supposed to do? And then not do it <laughs> and don't have your stuff done, okay? Because by Sunday night, I certainly do wanna see the entire story annotated at least some different colors, you know, hopefully following that color coding. And I want to see those, uh, those quiz questions done. I believe there's 10 of them. Okay. And then we'll move on from some other stuff. I'll make that all clear um, in, an, up, in uh, an update to the agenda or the assignment post. So questions from any of you guys before we go? All good. All right. Thanks for being here, you guys, making it a class. And I will see you live uh, on Monday. <laughs>